to be used against him by Richard Marsh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Om123 To be used against him by Richard Marsh 1. A Travelling Companion When the train left Liverpool Street, he and I were the only occupants of the compartment. I was in one corner, he was directly opposite me in the other. He appeared to have purchased the same evening papers which I had purchased. I noticed too a certain similarity in his movements to mine. When I lowered my paper, he lowered his. When I turned a page, he turned one also. This coincidence of action, I supposed at first, was accidental. But I perceived ere long that, if it was accidental, the accident was of a peculiar kind. Whatever I did, he did. When I exchanged one journal for another, he exchanged one also. I noticed in this respect that the imitation was so close that, when I relinquished a palm off for the St. James's, he relinquished a palm off for the St. James's. When I put my paper down and looked at him, he put his paper down and looked at me. I asked myself if this person intended to insult me. What conceivable reason could he have for entering a railway carriage with the apparently deliberate intention of insulting an inoffensive stranger, unless he was drunk or mad? Directly I began to observe him, I was struck by the fact that he resembled someone whom I had seen before. Who it was I couldn't for the instant recollect. I eyed him while he eyed me, endeavouring to recall to my mind who was the owner of his features. I believe that I have had the pleasure of meeting you before. When I addressed to him this commonplace, which so frequently is addressed to individuals whose personality one fails to recollect, to my surprise he replied to me in exactly the same words which I had used. I believe that I have had the pleasure of meeting you before. The tones of his voice were familiar to me. I had not only heard them before, but I had heard them recently. You are laughing at me because I cannot recollect your face. And yet it is proverbial among my friends that I have an excellent memory for faces. Scarcely had I finished speaking than he cured me. He repeated after me word for word what I had said. The man must be a mountebank. And yet the longer I looked at him, the better I seemed to know his face. Who was the fellow? May I venture to ask your name? The only reply which I received to my inquiry was my inquiry cured. The man must be some clowning spirit, who in revenge perhaps for my bad memory, proposed to amuse himself a little at my expense. When you are pleased to be more communicative, I will endeavour to apologise for my imperfect recollection. When you are pleased to be more communicative, I will endeavour to apologise, came the echo from the opposite corner. I confess that I was conscious of a certain feeling of irritation. The mildest of men does not care to be mocked and I am not prepared to say that I am the mildest of men. Still, I didn't propose to have in a railway carriage any unpleasantness with a man who, after all, might be a perfect stranger to me. So I gathered my papers and wraps together and withdrew to the other end of the carriage. Scarcely had I done so when the man who had been in front of me did likewise. He gathered his papers and his wraps. He came and planted himself in front of me at this end, as he had done at that. There could be no doubt that the action was intended to be impertinent. The thing was done too deliberately to admit of any other supposition. Still, I was not prepared to show resentment. I did not see how I could do so, that is, with any regard to my own dignity. I could scarcely have a vulgar squabble with a fellow then and there. The boat train does not stop between London and Harwich. We are compulsory companions while the journey lasted, unless I threw him out of the carriage window or he threw me better to endure his insolence, unless it became aggressive, until we reached our destination. I became tired of reading. I put down my paper. The man in front of me, in pursuance of his apparent policy of faithful imitation, simultaneously put down his. He returned the look with which I favoured him, but to that I was indifferent. 
I continued intently to study his countenance, asking myself when and where, before meeting in that carriage, I had encountered him before. He looked a gentleman. I was prepared to admit that he was a gentleman. He had about him that indefinable something which had the trained observer inevitably associates with his idea of a gentleman. He was probably between thirty and forty years of age. He was good-looking, with a long, sallow, oval face, which was innocent of moustache and whiskers, and a very curious mouth and chin. I think it was the peculiarity of that mouth and chin which impressed one with the consciousness that he might not be an agreeable man to quarrel with. There was something about the formation of the lower part of his face which was suggestive, though only to my imagination perhaps of cool, calculating, unflinching cruelty. I say that this might have been a suggestion of my imagination, but his eyes conveyed not merely a suggestion but an absolute certainty. They were the most beautiful eyes which I had ever seen. They were large and black, jet black and deep, so deep that it seemed impossible to penetrate their depths. The pupils had a curious trick of dilatation like a cat's. They were large at first and seemed to gleam with light. As you observed them, they grew perceptibly smaller until a point remained a point of light. No man could look at that man's eyes and doubt that he was as cruel as the grave. The unflinching way in which he met my gaze had a curious effect upon my nerves, though I am far from being a nervous man. The more I continued to observe him, the more persuaded I became that we had met before, not once but constantly. So firmly were his features impressed upon some mislaid tablet of my memory. Yet, try how I would, I could neither remember where I had seen him nor who he was. This was the more extraordinary, because he was possessed of so distinct an individuality that one was disposed to say that one need only set eyes upon him once, never to forget him. I could restrain my curiosity no longer. I leaned forward and regarding him fixedly, I said, Don't I know you? He leaned forward and regarding me fixedly, replied, Don't I know you? It was but an echo. The man persisted in his mockery, and yet the tones of his voice, with what a strange familiarity they seemed to ring in my ears, and at the same time how they grated on my nerves, how they filled me with a sense of irritation. He had advanced his face to within a few inches of my own. In the irritation of the moment, I was more than half disposed to strike him. The palm of my hand itched to salute his ears. I believed that I should have struck him, had I not all at once become conscious of the look which was in his eyes. The pupils grew and grew until they glared at me like a wild beast, then like a man. I drew back in my seat, stifling an exclamation. There could be no doubt whatever that murder was in the man's eyes, that he was mad. I lost him when we reached Harwich. I went at once to the Antwerp boat. The night was glorious. I remained on deck while the boat was being cast from her moorings. After she was out in the river, after she was out in the sea. I had no desire for a cabin. I did not trouble myself even to secure a boat. I had no desire for slumber. I, of course, was conscious that in my peculiar circumstances, sleep was a factor not to be neglected. Without a proper amount of sleep, a man's nervous system is bound to suffer, and when his nervous system suffers, the man suffers altogether. He loses perfect control of his mental faculties. To keep perfect control of my mental faculties was, to one in my position, literally a question of life or death. It is, I firmly believe, only when a man loses perfect control of his mental faculties that the police score what they call their successes. Therefore, to me, a proper amount of sleep was indispensable. But at the same time, I was aware of what was the exact amount I did require, and I knew that I wanted none just then. I was in no mood for slumber. I was in a mood to enjoy the perfect night, the fresh breezes, and the smell of the sea and I was in a mood after a while to think of Alan Foster. I wondered if he was still lying where I left him with his face to the ceiling. I am quite willing to admit that I felt a certain satisfaction in picturing him to my mind's eye exactly as I left him. I felt a certain pleasure in painting as vivid a picture as my imagination would allow me of the room in which I left him. A picture of the little details of the room, his chair and mine 
the shaded lamp upon the table, the look upon his face, when in that last swift moment he understood that I meant business. The inanimate thud with which he had banged on the floor. I wondered if he had made much mess, whether I ought to picture him with or without the chance of a crimson pool. If I had possessed the secrets of the magicians, I would have travelled back for an instant just to see. I had frequently speculated as to what would be the sensations of a man in my position. I do not know that there was anything remarkable about my own. I should say in no extraordinary sense that my sensations were those of satisfaction. When I had had enough of thinking of my last meetings with Alan Forster, my thoughts recurred to the fellow in the train. As I leaned over the side of the steamer, I taxed my brain with an effort to recollect where I had seen him. Again and again I had almost hit upon his trail, when it again escaped me. I couldn't think who the man might be. I wondered if he was in the boat, bound with us for Antwerp, or whether he was journeying in the boat to Rotterdam. Thus wondering, I stood up, and turning to the smoke room, which was just behind me, saw him at my side. I owned that I was startled. I had supposed that I was the only person upon deck. He certainly had not been there a moment back. I had heard no one approach, yet there he was, leaning as I was leaning, with one hand upon the side of the vessel, his eyes fixed intently upon mine. For some moments we continued in silence to observe each other. As we did so, I was conscious that his glance began to fill me with a species of vague discomfort, if I may say so, with a sort of horror. It was absurd to suppose that I should allow him to continue to amuse himself at my expense. I spoke to him. May I ask, sir, if you have any intention of dozing my steps? He said nothing. He continued to look at me. And the more he looked at me, the less I liked the look of him. It is not a fact, sir, that you and I have met before. It is. The voice in which he uttered the two little monosyllables was such a familiar voice. A voice which was so well known to me that the mere fact of its exceeding familiarity filled me, although it may appear exaggeration on my part to say so, with a vague sense of pain. Surely the sound of that voice has been ringing in my ears for years. May I ask, sir, where we have met before? He was silent, less and less did I like the expression which was in his beautiful eyes. May I ask, sir, what is your name? I have no connection with the police. It is true that the peculiarity of his demeanour, the intentness of his gaze, the sense of discomfort with which I was conscious that his presence began to fill me, had led me inwardly to inquire if the fellow could be in any way connected with the police. But I had not formulated the inquiry in words. How come he then to reply to my unspoken query? Could he be connected with the hounds of Scotland yet? The suspicion of such a possibility filled me with a sudden passion, with one of those ugly rages for which among my friends I believe I am well known. I moved towards him, bent on me, chief. As I moved towards him, he moved towards me. His eyes were fixed on mine. I protest that of no man living have I ever been afraid, and of no man dead, of things of flesh, not of things of air. I have never hesitated, even for an instant, to do anything because I was afraid. Witness my career. I protest that until that moment I believed myself to be incapable of the thing called fear. But when, in that moment, I met his eyes and saw them well, and in the moonlight clearly, I was afraid. I slunk away and stole into the smoke room and left him there. When I entered the smoke room, still tingling with the consciousness of having played the coward, I found it in the position of three persons, two were upon one side, and had arranged themselves in such a position that each was able to stretch out his feet on the seat in front of him. Both were asleep. The other seat was occupied by a single individual. He also was asleep. He lay stretched out at full length upon the seat in such a manner that at his feet there was only left space enough to enable me to crowd myself in the corner. This vacant space I occupied. As I sat there, in that cramped position, my feelings towards that luxurious individual were not of the friendliest kind. He was evidently in the enjoyment of perfect comfort. He was actually snoring, 
while he had left me scarcely room enough to breathe. I was telling myself that it would serve him well right if I were to pull his nose with sufficient vigour to rouse him out of his state of self stupor to a consciousness of the requirements of the situation when the door opened and the man came in from whom I had slunk away. He paid no attention to me whatever. He stood looking down at the snoring sleeper. As he looked, the expression of his countenance was simply diabolical. It startled even me, as I sat looking on. Lower and lower, towards the sleeper, he bent his cruel, handsome face. Suddenly putting out his hand, he grasped the sleeper's nose and wrung it with such savage ferocity that I half expected to see the nose torn right off the victim's face. No man could continue wrapped in slumber whose nose had been handled in such fashion as that man's nose was handled then. The snorer not only ceased to snore, but he sprang to his feet and emitted a yell which must have been audible throughout the ship. The little apartment was in confusion. We were all of us upon our feet. The sufferer fondled his nose, as well he might. The adjectives which proceeded from his lips my pain is unable to record. Who did it? he yelled. Who did it? He glared at each of us in turn, as if disposed, in the first paroxysms of his pain, to regard us all there as guilty parties. His actual assailant had vanished like a coward through the door. I was just about to point this out when, to my amazement, the man who had been sleeping just in front of me charged me with the assault. I repelled the charge with all the indignation with which, on the impulse of the moment, I was capable. The man declared that he had seen me do the deed. Why, I cried, only at a loss to conceive what could have induced him even to imagine such a thing. You were asleep. I was bitten sleeping and walking. He replied, I saw you looking at that gentleman. I saw you lean over him when I saw you pull his nose. If I had not shown the sufferer pretty clearly that discretion upon his part would be the better part of valor, I believed that he would have attacked me there and then. I declared, upon my honour, not only that my cues are light, but that I was incapable of the conduct with which he charged me. I explained whose was the guilt. The man came in and looked at you, and pulled your nose. Before so completely was I taken by surprise at what seemed to me to be so unprovoked an outrage, I could stop him. He was gone again. We went out to look for the miscreant. We sought for him in all directions, but he was not on deck. No signs of him were to be seen. We asked the watch if he had noticed anybody moving. He declared that he had noticed me, but that with the exception of myself no one had been on the deck for the last hour or more. It is certain that the sailor was deceived, as he might very easily be in that uncertain light, but the gentleman whose nose had suffered looked at me, as though if he only did he would. I know not if the story got about. And if the general verdict was that I was the guilty party, but it certainly seemed to me, throughout the rest of the journey, that the whole of the passengers gave me plenty of elbow room. Not a soul could I get to exchange a word with me during our passage up the shelf. Whoever I spoke to immediately found that something required his presence in another portion of the ship. More than once, before we arrived at Antwerp, I was on the point of showing my resentment. But, until we drew up at the quay, I never caught even a glimpse of the ruffian for whose outrageous conduct it seemed I was temporarily suffering. I entered the train for Brussels. It seemed, until just as the train was turning, that I was to have the compartment to myself. When the signal had been actually given, and the train was already in motion, the door at the opposite end of the carriage opened, and a man came in who had wrung the unconscious sleeper's nose half off his face. With the calmest air in the world, he came down the carriage and placed himself on the seat in front of me. This was a little more than I could stand. As you have come in, sir, you must excuse me if I get out. I put my hand through the window to unfasten the door, but the engine had got up steam. We were clear of the station. To have attempted to align would have been to infringe the bylaws of the railway company. I should have found myself in the hands of the authorities. There was nothing for it but to make the best of the situation, and to treat my unwelcome companion with all the philosophy at my command. I put my legs up on the seat. I prepared to take my ease. My companion did exactly as I did. He put his legs up on the seat, and he prepared to take his ease. But I was not to be moved by such a trifle as that. If it was his humour to play the mountebank, his humour caused no sort of inconvenience to me. 
as the train moved through the flat country which lies between the Antwerp and the Malines and beyond. I, for my part, was wrapped in thought, until the silence was disturbed by my common companion. It's not bad fun, this running away from the police. The fellow's words were so exactly interpreted the thoughts which had been passing through my brain that I could not help but let him see that I was startled. I moved my legs from off the seat and turned and faced him. Still bent on imitation, he turned himself towards me. The fellow filled me with such a sense of curious repugnance that I was at a loss for words with which to address him. He, however, seemed to be completely at his ease. He began lazily to remove his gloves. Having removed them, he held out towards me his hands. I noticed what white, slender artist hands they were. Look at them. They are white enough. They are without a stain, and yet they have died in blood. He spoke in the tone of voice which seemed to be so intensely familiar. They died with the blood of a friend, of the best friend man ever had. I killed him, my best friend. He leaned back in his seat. There was a smile about his lips which seemed to me to be the incarnation of all cruelty. I killed him because I hated him, and a little I think because he loved me so. He had always trusted me, and I had always played him false, and the more I played him false, the more he trusted me. For that, I hated him. I robbed him of his monies, and he pretended that the things which I had stolen had been his gifts to me. For that, I hated him the more. So having robbed him of great things all his life, I robbed him out of pure pastime, of a little thing. I robbed him of his wife. This fool, he loved his wife. He loved her, I do believe, better than his soul. So when he learned what I had done just for the sport of it, he dared to show resentment, for which I killed him there and then. I killed him when his heart was hard with rage against his well-tried friend. That was yesterday at six. I left him there just where he fell upon the floor. I went round to my rooms. I slipped a few things in my dressing bag. I caught the boat train at Liverpool Street. I am en route for Brussels, and after that I know not where. The fellow laughed softly to himself. It was the most dreadful sound I had ever heard. Was he man, or was he devil? That he could read the inmost secrets of my heart, only to make a jest of them like that. It was not his own tale he had told. It was mine. I had slain my friend only a couple of hours before I had met this fellow in the Harwich train. Already I didn't doubt that the avengers of blood flattered themselves that they were upon my heels. How come this man to know what was hidden from all the world but me? I knew not what to say to him. What was there to be said? Unless I took him by the throat and crushed the life from him. I would have done it had I dared. But for the second time in my life my courage failed me. I didn't dare. There was something about this man which I knew so well, it frightened me. I racked my tortured brain with the unanswered, and it seemed unanswerable question. Where had I seen this man before? Not another word was spoken upon either side until we reached Brussels. As the train drew into the station, I rose and said, Well, is it your intention to accompany me farther? He shrugged his shoulders, and he smiled. I went out, and I left him sitting there. But all the time as the cab drove through the busy streets to the hotel, I felt as though that man were sitting in the cab door at my side. 2. The Haunted Man After dinner, by way of a little relaxation, I went to a certain cafe where there are women who sing. I do not pretend that the place was a place of particularly good repute, or that the entertainment which it offered was in any sense worth listening to. As a matter of fact, the performance was execrably bad and abominably dull. Indeed, the place was a vulgar and backward place, and therefore excellently suited to the humor I was in, for I was in a blackguard frame of mind. I sat drinking the poisonous concoction which they call absinthe et alanisite, while one of the chantuses, a hideous fat omen, hovered above me and asked for drink. On the table next to mine, there were some papers. I drew them towards me. Among them was the London paper of that day's date. It was uncut. I had travelled quicker than I had, having probably reached Brussels by the Austin rule. Opening it, my eyes searched down the columns. Delighted on a paragraph which was hated, dreadful tragedy in Sagal Street. 
I read the paragraph. It was a narrative up to the date of Alan Foster's murder. It seemed that they must have discovered the body only a few minutes after I left the house. Alan's man had gone to the room and knocked, and having received no answer had tried the handle, and found that the door was locked. He waited some minutes, then returned, and as he still received no answer to his knocking, fearing that Alan was ill inside the room, he sent for assistance, and had the door forced open. Braidwood had been in the service of Alan's father. He had tended Alan himself almost since he was a child. I pictured the old man's face as he saw his master lying dead, murdered, on the floor. It seemed that the body had made a mess. The newspaper said that a corpse was discovered lying in a great pool of blood. I could not altogether understand how that could be. I was positive that I had spitted the heart with one blow, given at Alan's own stiletto, a long slender weapon scarcely broader than a botkin. It seemed hardly probable that much blood would flow from such a wound as that. The paragraph concluded by stating that the police were on the track of the assassin, and that a warrant had been issued at Scotland Yard. So we shall see. When I had finished reading this instructive item of current news, a chant news came around, a skull of shell in her hand, soliciting subscriptions to compensate her in some measure for the vocal agony which she had been recently enduring. As I glanced up to drop some sous into her cell, my eye chanced upon a man who was seated at a table right in front of me, but on the opposite side of the room. It was the man of the train. He too was reading a journal, just as I had been doing, and apparently his was an English journal too. As I looked at him, he looked at me, and raising the paper pointed to a particular paragraph it contained, indulging that soft devilish laughter of his, which seemed to fill my very soul with horror as I heard. The sensation with which I regarded this man, and heard his horrid laughter, and felt his eyes upon her face, filled me with a feeling of the profoundest physical repulsion. My God! I cried unconsciously aloud, who is this man? The chant you still lingered in front of me. She supposed that my question was addressed to her. Which man? That man sitting at the table there? Mon Dieu! Is it not Monsieur's Corsican brother? The omen's words struck a chord which had been vibrating in my memory, yet which had escaped my keenest search. No wonder I supposed that I had seen this fellow's face before. It was so like my own, and as the sudden revelation of the fact that this was so flashed upon my brain, such a sense of horror came rushing, whirling over me, that I staggered like a drunken man. The woman must have thought that I was mad, because so soon as I had recovered sufficient self-control, I rushed out of the place and into the busy street beyond. I tore along the Volvo du Nord like a thing. Such was my haste that I came into unwitting contact with someone who was advancing in the contrary direction to my own. It was a little child, a little girl. She had been the force of the collision that I had flung her back upon the stones. I picked her up. I took her in my arms. I soothed her tears. She was a little thing, thin and pale and poorly clad. I made her distress my own. I pressed some silver coins into her hand and begged her to forgive my unintentional transgression. The sight of the silver coins seemed to have more effect even than my words in the drying of her tears. She so looked at them, and through the tumult of her grief there already dawned a smile. I was just about to make my peace and leave her, happy in the position of our newfound wealth, when a man came striding across the street at the rate of a good six miles an hour. It was the man whom that Gentius had suggested was my Corsican brother. He caught the child from off the ground. He struck her with his hand. He kicked her with his foot. He tossed her out into the gutter. It was the cruelest thing. And then, as she lay crying where she had fallen, he turned to me and pointed to her, and laughing, disappeared into the crowd, leaving me standing where he had come on me, riveted to the ground. The child's cries attracted the attention of the passers-by. They advanced to her assistance. I advanced to the rest. But to my amazement, the ungrateful creature cried out the more at the sight of me and shrank back as though I were a plague. What is the matter with your little one? inquired the bystanders. He beat me, he kicked me, he threw me out into the road. The little child stretched out her hand towards me, as though I had been guilty of these things. The wickedness of a such a surge, made by one whom I had so recently befriended, for the moment took my breath away. 
but instead of treating the child's wanton accusation with the incredulity which I naturally expected, the bystanders turned on me with black looks and lowering brows. To treat a little child like that, they said. Messieurs at Madame, I exclaimed, so far from treating a child like that, I would not injure a single hair upon her hair. This little child is laboring under some extraordinary delusion. It is not I who did this thing. The miscreant was guilty of this wanton cruelty vanished as quickly as he came. He was a stranger, ladies and gentlemen, to me. But rather than this little child to suffer, even at a stranger's hands, I will present her with an apalea with which to dry her tears. It is not money which will pay for conduct such as that. The people crowded round me. There were some of them whose feasts were clenched. The looks with which they regarded me were anything but looks of love. Ominous murmurs were in the air. It would have needed but little to have induced them to lay on me hands of violence. It was with the greatest difficulty that I appeased their anger. It cost me five Nepalese to dry the sufferer's tears. Such incidents as that, if repeated, were likely to prove expensive to speak of nothing else. It was with feelings of the strongest resentment towards the scoundrel who hung upon my footsteps that I pursued my way towards my hotel. More than once I suspected that he was at my side, or just behind me. Once I distinctly heard his footsteps keeping pace with mine. I turned. He was peering over my shoulder, actually pushing his face against mine. Well, he said and smiled. In my sudden justifiable fury, I struck at him. He nimbly moved aside, so that he escaped my blow. Laughing that low, soft laughs of his, before I could pursue him, he vanished in the crowd. It was certain, if I was to continue to endure the infliction of this fellow's presence, that my health would suffer, and chiefly on my health rested my chances of safety. If it failed me, it was not impossible that I might fall in the toils of those banglers at Scotland Yard. They would then say, you say that we never make a capture. See what a capture we have made now. When all the time it was not their wit which had prevailed, but it was that the find who hung upon my heels who had played into their hands. I resolved to go straight to bed. When I reached the hotel, I noticed that a man from whom I demanded a key of my apartment seemed to look at me in askance. I am tired, I explained. I have been travelling all night. I am going to get some sleep. It is that which I require sleep. The man said nothing, but it seemed to me that he was extremely careful to keep himself at arm's length of me. What was there about my personal appearance which should make this fellow anxious not to come in contact with my person, or which should cause him to stare at me like that? As I ascended the staircase, I met a young man who was coming down, servant of the hotel, or some such thing as that. She had a smile upon her face, but when she caught sight of me and her eyes met mine, the smile vanished. I never before saw so sudden and so singular a change come over a woman's face. She shrank away from me sideways against a wall, as though she was afraid that I would strike her. My child, I said, what is the matter with you? You stare at me as do I were a ghost. She didn't answer me, and she ran down the stairs with the swiftness of the wind. What should induce the woman to behave like that? If there was anything curious about my face, it was owing to the want of sleep. It was only sleep which I required, nothing more. At last I cried when I entered my apartment. At last I am alone, free from all that noisy crowd in the enjoyment of my own company. Now for slumber, for a little closing of my eyes in sleep. As I moved across the room, I remembered that I had omitted to lock the door. It would never do to overlock that ceremony. Or that ill omened wretch, in his measureless impertinence, might even venture to invade the precincts of my bedchamber. I turned to supply the omission, and in the very act of turning perceived that a man had been before me. I was too late. The fellow had taken instantaneous advantage of my slight forgetfulness, and already had forced himself upon my privacy. He stood only a step or two in front of me, with a look upon his face such as surely is only to be seen upon the faces of the friends in hell. It was a look which I had not seen before. It was instinct with some dreadful meaning. The pupils of his eyes were distended to a monstrous size. They gleamed as if with fire. But I was not to be frightened by his threatening looks at a moment such as that. I had come there to seek that peace which seemed to have eluded me since yesternight. And if I could not have peace, I would at least have privacy. 
I would not have any solitude polluted by the presence of that thing of evil. He should go out. He should go out. Even though in the struggle there was murder done, and he murdered me as I had murdered Alan Foster in his room the night before. With my blood coursing through my veins as if it were a stream of liquid fire, I advanced upon that messenger from hell. As I advanced on him, he advanced on me. I stretched out my arms to take him by the throat, he copying my actions in all the details. I gave a spring to grasp at him, the wildest passion burning in my heart, and I struck against a mirror. I struck against a mirror. Oh my God! The thing of evil which I thought to grasp was but the image of myself mirrored in a glass. That creature on whose countenance was pictured all the patience of all the fiends was my own image mirrored in a glass. That human animal whose eyes gleamed cruelty and shouted murder was my own image mirrored in a glass. The dreadful being who had been my almost constant companion since the moment in which I had struck the devil's blow, and who had read the inmost secrets of my heart, and whose ostentatious wickedness had so filled my soul with loathing, had been all the time but the image of myself mirrored in a glass. I could not believe that a thing could be. I could not believe that a messenger from hell was formed in my own likeness, but it was so. There could be no doubt about it. The thing was as plain as day. A mirror ran from floor to ceiling. I stood close up to it. There, staring at me in the silvered glass, a smiling find was myself. In the dreadful moment when I first realized what manner of man indeed I was, my legs trembled beneath me, and I would have sunk upon my knees to plead for mercy from my God, only that I lacked the courage. It was not me whose hands ran blood to speak with God. And yet it would have been better that I had dared. For as I stood there, striving to obtain the courage which should enable me to shape my lips in the utterance of a prayer, there came a touch upon my soldier, and turning I beheld at my side the man in the train. He pointed to the mirror, and he smiled, as he always seemed to smile, yet devil smile. You see, we make a pair. I am you, and you are me. How strange you should not have known me when first we met. How strange you should not have known your own voice when first you heard it, he going in the train. I knew it now. I knew my own voice as it proceeded from his lips. Then I understood how it was that its exceeding familiarity had seemed to fill me with such a sense of bitter pain. I had been sent in order that you may be able to see just what sort of man you are. I am the power which has been given you to enable you to see yourself as others see you. I will be with you to the end, a mirror ever ready to your hand. He stopped, and he whispered in my ear, and he smiled, a devil's smile. You know, it was murder. There was nothing gallant in the deed. It was the act of a coward and a car. See, it was like this. He took me by the arm and he turned me round, and I saw a table, on which there was a shaded lamp, and at this table he sat a man and his face was that of a true man, and the light in his eyes were pure and good, and I knew that it was Alan. And this fellow went and sat on a chair which was on the other side of the table, and he looked at Alan. And as the lamplight fell upon his features, I noticed what a difference there was between his looks and Alan's. They both were handsome men, but Alan was a fair-haired, blue-eyed, open-faced English gentleman. The other's was the cleverer face, but there was something in it, notably in the expression of the mouth and of the eyes, which repelled, something which told me, as I stood watching there, that the heart within the man was evil. And Alan said, How well I knew his full, clear voice, and as he spoke there was a cloud upon his sunny face. Jack, I hope you won't mind my saying what I am going to say, but I was bound to ask you here so that we might have it out between us. I was bound, old man. The man up on the other side of the table smiled. My dear Alan, pray don't apologize. Jack, Alan rose. He began pacing to and fro. He seemed to have to dare to say which he found it difficult to utter. Jack, you remember when Doris left me? How, how, how my heart was broken, you were quite sure, Jack. I only ask it as a matter of form, old man, because of course I know that no man ever had a better friend than you have been to me. You were quite sure, Jack, that you knew nothing of our going... The other was a moment or two before he answered, and during that moment or two he smiled. 
rapier was lying on the table, a long, glittering, slender blade, which Alan had brought home with him from India, and which it had been his habit to use as a paper knife. The blade was so slender, the temper of the steel was so true, and the handle was so heavy, that one had but to hold it, point downwards five or six feet from the ground, and drop it, for it to bury itself almost to the hilt in the wood. The man on the other side of the table draw this odd paper knife of Alan's to him. He began to play with it. As he did so, his smile became a very peculiar one indeed. My dear Alan, don't you think it is unnecessary for to such old friends as you and I to pay any attention to mere matters of form? Besides, it is nearly two years since Doris left you. Some man would have forgotten such a wife in a week. I thought she was forgotten long ago. Forgotten? You thought that I had forgotten Doris, Jack? Forgotten her, my darling? I shall never forget Doris while I have life. If she were to come back to me this moment, or if she comes back to me in ten years' time, I will take her to my arms again. If she only come, and I will forgive for everything. But you have heard me say that sort of thing over and over again. Just answer my question, Jack. You are quite sure that you knew nothing of her going? My dear Alan, don't you think that it is rather late in the day to ask me such a question as that? Of course I know it's late in the day, and of course I know that the whole thing is an absurdity, but the fact is, old man, some man, some man have been saying... Alan paused, as if he were at a loss for words. The man on the other side of the table continued to smile and to trifle with the paper knife. Well, some men have been saying, what? Some men have been saying that you knew more about her going than you pretended. That is the truth for you, old man. There was a slight pause. When the man upon the other side of the table spoke, there was something so peculiar in his tone of voice that even blundering, slowly that Alan must have noticed it. My dear Alan, it would be just as well that you and I should have a clear and perfect understanding once for all. It will have to come one day, and why not now? I wish you clearly understand that I am as sick of hearing Doris's name as I am sick of Doris. Jack, Alan. What do you mean? I say that I am as sick of hearing Doris's name as I am sick of Doris. That is what I say, and that is what I mean. You are sick of Doris? Do you know where she is? I know very well indeed where she is. Jack, where is she? She is in a house for which I paid a rent, but thank goodness with your money and not with mine. It is only right, my dear Alan, that you should pay house rent for your own wife. Jack, say, say that you lie. My dear Alan, I shall not say that I lie, because I don't. It seemed that Alan could only gasp. Doris ran away with me, you fool. She never cared for you a pinch of snuff from the beginning. When I acted as your best man, and she stood by your side at the altar, I knew that it was for me she cared. It was the old story of Ilya Tozo Akim. Alote Kipegme. Always, Alan. When you had married her, I thought I would take her from you. So I took her. It was the easiest thing. The joke of it was that you never suspected it was I. You made of me your confident instead. And what a blind fool you have always been, dear boy. But the thing has got beyond a joke. Doris has become a nuisance. I never cared for her. As I said, I am as sick of hearing Doris's name as I am sick of Doris. There was a pause. Alan said nothing, but with the cry of a wounded lion, he rushed upon the man who sat at the other side of the table. The man waited for his spring. Just as Alan was upon him, he rose, holding the glittering weapon with which he had been playing above him in the air. He drove it to the hilt into Alan's breast. With the utterance of a sound, Alan banged backwards onto the floor. I saw him lying there, and I knew that he was dead. My dearest friend, he whose chief crime had been that he loved not wisely, but too well. The wretch who had done this deed of darkness turned towards me and said, with about his lips and his eyes, that David smiled. You see, it was like that you did it. 
I covered my face with my hands and tried to hide from my eyes that dreadful sigh. And when again I removed my hands, the table with the shaded lamp had vanished, and the dead man upon the floor, and there was nothing there but that wretch who regarded me with his unceasing smile. And as I looked at him and he at me, the door of the apartment opened, and three men came in, one of them advanced to the wretch standing in the center of the room. He laid his hand upon his shoulder, and he said in cold, stern tones, John Alton, you are my prisoner. I arrest you for willful murder. There was a flash of something in the air. I knew that a pair of handcuffs had been produced. The wretch had remained quiescent for a moment, as if stupefied by an unexpected blow. But when he saw the glittering fetters, he leapt upon the officer, and in an instant he bore him to the ground. The others ran to the assistance of their fallen comrade, or there would have been another murder done, and I should have seen a second corpse lying on the floor before my eyes. The guilty wretch, in his wild frenzy, bit and scratched and tore and kicked and fought and screamed and yelled, like the thing which indeed he was, a fiend from hell. Strangers steamed into the apartment. The room was filled with people, and in the midst of one man against a tree. They fought like devils, here, there, and everywhere. But at last they mastered him, the tree against the one, and in that same instant the scoundrel vanished. And I lay there up on the floor, torn and scratched and bruised and bleeding, with jibes upon my wrists. And I dared to say it was I who had struggled. They lied. Why should I have struggled? Was it because I was afraid of them? Does it look as though I were afraid of them? Now that I am writing this, every word of which they tell me will be used against me. What do I care what they use against me? I repeat it once more in black and white. It was I killed Alan Foster. I. And it is my complete conviction that under the same circumstances I should kill the fool again. The so-called terrors of the law have no terrors for me. They are quite welcome to take me to any place of execution they may please, and they are to hang me by the neck till I am dead. End of to be used against him.